so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maha Haji. Uh, so Maha is an incoming assistant professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering here at Cornell. She's starting this summer. Uh, she also will be joint with system engineering. We'll, we'll be teaching um, uh, a class that will be uh, cross-listed and, and uh, will be a nice complement to both programs. She's also going to launch her new lab called the Symbiotic Engineering and Analysis Lab. Um, currently, she's finishing up a two-year stint as a joint researcher between Cornell and MIT. At MIT, she's working with um, uh, Ollie DeWick in the Engineering Systems Laboratory, and she's doing some research there as well as doing some teaching. Uh, a little bit more on her background. She got her PhD from MIT um, in mechanical and oceanographic engineering in 2017. Uh, it's a joint program between MIT and Woods Hole. And, her, uh, and she focused on the design and prototyping of symbiotic system to harvest uranium from seawater. Uh, and she got her bachelor's in mechanical engineering and applied math from UC Berkeley. So with that, I'll pass it off to Ma. Awesome. Thanks, Mark, for the introduction. Um, and thanks, everyone. It's great to be here uh, and to be part of the Ezra Roundtable. So I'm going to start sharing my screen to see my slides. Um, are folks able to see the slides OK? Yep, looks good. Awesome, thank you. So today I'm gonna to be talking about um, the work I've been doing on how you might design symbiotic systems for passive extraction of minerals from seawater. Um, and as Mark mentioned, some of this work is work that I started in my PhD looking specifically at uranium. And then towards the end of the talk, I'll also touch upon some other minerals that could be of interest where these kinds of systems could apply specifically things like cobalt, lithium and more. So to start, why might we want to extract minerals from seawater? Well, when we look at the sources of where we get most of our minerals from the United States, many of these uh, sources are international. So as you can see on the pie chart on the right, uh, China produces a lot of the world's minerals. Next up is places like Australia, South Africa, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So from just a supply security standpoint, um, nationally, we, we don't source a lot of our own minerals. Secondly, these terrestrial reserves of many of minerals are diminishing. So if we're going to start needing to uh, use these minerals more in our daily lives, we're going to have to find new sources for them. Um, if we look at the global demand for mineral use, uh, it's increasing rapidly. So things like rare earth elements are increasing in demand by anywhere from 5 to 9% per year. Um, this is because a lot of clean energy technologies, renewable energy technologies require these minerals. Things like batteries require minerals such as lithium and cobalt. Um, photovoltaic cells can require things like tellurium, gallium, and indium, all of which are rare earth elements. And uh, luckily the oceans contain vast quantities of many of these minerals. And um, if we can harvest it from the ocean, those that are dissolved uh, in the water, there's the potential that we could have a reduced environmental impact in mining than we currently do from terrestrial based mining. So looking at uh, seawater itself and the minerals that are available in it, um, we can look at minerals that are considered critical uh, and see which ones are available in seawater. So in 2011, the Department of Energy published this critical materials strategy booklet. And they looked at uh, minerals that were really gonna be in high demand for clean energy technologies. And so this uh, table on the right, you can see uh, we have different clean energy technologies and the key elements that the DOE highlighted. Um, so clean energy technologies such as grid storage, uh, batteries, fuel cells, nuclear power, uh, photovoltaic cells, and more. And then on the right on the table, uh, those elements that are available in seawater are highlighted in blue. So you can see a lot of them light up uh, that are available in seawater, lithium, vanadium, cobalt, uranium, magnesium, and the list goes on. And the DOE actually mapped some of these minerals uh, into a... Uh, 2D space of what is the supply risk from land the, that, we, that we have these minerals on land versus how important are they to clean energy. So for instance, uh, something like nickel on land is pretty abundant. So perhaps we have a pretty low supply risk, but it's pretty important to clean energy. So with that mapping, it's not considered critical. 
But uh, as we get into higher supply risks, so things like lithium have a higher supply risk as well as a higher importance to clean energy. So those are considered near critical elements at the time. And uh, uh, the higher up you go in this, uh, you get more and more critical. And the primary concern they found uh, were these rare earth elements that I mentioned earlier, many of which are available in seawater. So I'll start off by discussing very deeply uranium, but the case is very similar for a lot of these other minerals, and I'll, I'll touch upon some more of those towards the end. So if we look specifically at uranium for nuclear power, um, there's really a growing need for energy. Our world energy consumption is expected to grow by 56% by 2040, and our global population is continuing to increase, uh, expected to increase by over 50% by 2100. These two really uh, push our need for energy. And at the same time, there's a need for this energy to have low carbon emissions. So when we look at uh, nuclear power, we see that one gram of uranium-235 can produce as much energy as burning 1.5 million grams of coal. And if you just look at how much uh, volume that takes up, one gram of uranium takes up about one seventh of a penny, whereas burning 1.5 million grams of coal is equivalent to the same space as 2.7 million pennies. So even from just a resource extraction perspective, um, we're vastly different in terms of orders of magnitude to produce the same amount of energy. Um, unfortunately, like many minerals, in the case of uranium, terrestrial reserves are not uniform. So what we see in the global distribution of identified uranium resources, uh, we see some countries have the bulk of the supply and this, this is the same for lots of different minerals. So for instance, Australia has 29% uh, of the identified uranium resources in the world. Next up is Kazakhstan at 13% as well as Russia at 9%. And so uh, a big issue arises um, here, as well as when we look at where uranium production occurs. Uh, so the countries that, that have the resources and then produce them um, is also not evenly distributed throughout the world. So Kazakhstan accounts in 2014 for 41% of um, our uranium production annually. So what this me really means is that um, there can be global cost insecurity if uh, there's any sort of geopolitical tensions at play between different countries who hold the vast resources uh, if we really rely on uranium for our nuclear fuel. Uh, secondly, terrestrial uranium supply is limited like many other uh, minerals that I mentioned. So uh, it's speculated uh, and estimated that at our current rate of usage of uranium for nuclear power, we only have a, about 100 years left of it if we just look at terrestrial resources. Now, this is a really big problem because uh, when we build a nuclear power plant, we usually build it uh, you know, decades out uh, before it's actually functional because it's such a high infrastructure uh, heavy project. And then it's meant to run for you know, 50 or more years. So really having the fuel for that reactor run out within a hundred years is uh, very detrimental to this technology. Um, there's uh, new unconventional sources of uranium on land, which could mean uh, drilling deeper and dirtier, um, which maybe could push this out quite a bit. But luckily, if we look at uh, seawater, there's uh, orders of magnitude more, uh, over 4,000 million tons as compared to 48 million tons on land. So there's, there's quite a lot of uranium in seawater if we could just uh, capture a bit of it. So we see that there's a threefold motivation for uh, extracting uranium from seawater. And these three motivations hold for lots of different minerals. So one is from a supply security standpoint, if we could get it from seawater, then pretty much any country with a coastline could provide this mineral for itself. Secondly, as we expand the number of countries that can uh, gather their own minerals, um, you get more cost security because you are less dependent on um, socio global socio-political relationships uh, being great. And then thirdly, there's the possibility that uh, we could have a much lower environmental footprint. Uh, depending on how we do it from the oceans, we may be able to sidestep a lot of the issues uh, that land-based and terrestrial mining have. However, there's a really big challenge uh, when it comes to extracting minerals from the ocean. So they exist in extremely low concentrations in seawater. So here's a look at seawater concentration for a number of different uh, minerals. So you see things like uh, sodium, magnesium, calcium, lithium, uh, and then all the way at the bottom, 
um, right here is a, a carbonate complex that includes uranium. Most elements of interest are in very low concentrations in seawater. So the transition elements like uh, nickel, zinc, uh, and copper are in parts per billion, whereas rare earth elements can be in parts per trillion. And then uh, uranium itself is in parts per billion down here. What this means is that if we're going to extract it from the dissolved, uh, from its dissolved uh, state in seawater, we're really gonna need to process massive volumes of seawater. Uh, and so the solution instead is instead of processing and actively pumping all this seawater, or can we create some kind of passive adsorption technology that just binds with these ions in, in the water passively? And so this has been uh, developed for quite a while now. Uh, it, it was considered to be the most promising method of uranium extraction from seawater in terms of cost, uh, capacity, and environmental footprint. And so it was started, uh, the, uh, the idea when you start is that you take some kind of fiber and you graft onto it what's called amidoxime, which is a ligand that uh, uh, provides uranium affinity. It actually binds with uranium ions in the water. And you add an hydrophilic co-monomer to increase the amount of water that will want to interact with this fiber. From there, uh, the fiber is functionalized and can be deployed in the ocean from anywhere from 30 to 60 days. Um, and while it's deployed there, the uranium will literally passively adsorb onto po the polymer and bind with its various active sites on that amidoxine ligand. Uh, the polymer can then be run through an elution bath and depending on the chemistry of your polymer, the chemistry of the elution bath can change. But generally uh, the latest technology, it's just a mostly deionized water solution with some sodium bicarbonate. And that bath will remove uranium and other elements that have bound to the polymer. The polymer can actually be redeployed uh, if it's a pretty gentle elution bath. And uh, the uranium ions and the aqueous solution can actually be processed into yellow cake. Um, there's a real benefit here because our current methods of uranium mining from land um, require a lot of water and processing. So we already have systems in place to take a aqueous solution that includes uranium ions and process it into yellow cake. So we can tie into that supply chain really well. And so the question uh, here is that, um, when we have these adsorbents, uh, how will we get all the water to them? Should we use something like active pumping to provide the water flow to remove uh, the minerals from the seawater or should there be another method? So if we looked at uh, active pumping scenarios, uh, we really want to limit how much extra water we're pumping to land for this purpose. So let's think about how we can tie into existing systems that already pump large volumes of water on land. One of these systems is uh, nuclear power plants themselves. They need a lot of water for cooling. So what if we use the seawater that's already being pumped on shore to cool a nuclear reactor and extract the uranium from the water that's being using, uh, used by the reactor to be cooled? So if we consider a, a, a direct cooling method, which is uh, once through cooling uses the most amount of seawater, a one gigawatt nuclear power plant would require 1.4 cubic kilometers of seawater per year for direct cooling. That translates to 160 cubic kilometers of seawater per year, uh, 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 excuse me. On the other hand, in order to harvest enough uranium fuel for that one gigawatt nuclear power plant, we need to process 160 cubic kilometers of seawater per year because of how dilute the uranium is in the seawater. So what this really means is we'd need to pump over 115 times more water to our nuclear reactor to provide the fuel that it needs than is required to cool it. So this really big difference in uh, orders of magnitude really suggests that this is a not a feasible strategy because we'd have to do so much more pumping than we already do. What, what's another system that we pump a lot of seawater on land for? Uh, that is desalination. So what if we tied into existing desalination plants and harvest uh, uranium or other minerals uh, from the water that's already pumped on shore for them? So uh, if we take a look at that same one gigawatt nuclear power plant, it would require us to process about 53 cubic kilometers of brine flow per year to get enough uranium from that brine. 
Uh, we need less here, as, as you saw before, it was 160 cubic kilometers of seawater per year for that uranium fuel. Here it's 53 cubic kilometers of brine because brine is much more concentrated with these salts and ions than, than seawater. Processing that amount of brine really translates to a nuclear, excuse me, a desalination plant that produces 77 billion gallons of fresh water per day. And if we look at the largest desalination plant in the world, Ras al Khair in Saudi Arabia, it produces 270 million gallons of fresh water per day. So again, we're in this situation where we would need a desalination plant that generates 285 times more fresh water than the largest desalination plant in the world to provide enough fuel for a one gigawatt nuclear reactor. So again, in this situation, the, the, the size uh, difference in magnitude um, really, uh, uh, really makes it difficult for this to be a viable strategy. So instead of pumping, uh, we believe the solution is really to forego that and instead use ocean currents to our benefit and let them do the work of bringing the water to the adsorbent for the uranium extraction. Some previous uranium extraction strategies uh, involved taking that adsorbent um, out to sea and bringing it back to land for any chemical processes, the elution process, the regeneration, and then going back out to redeploy it afterward. So this was first studied uh, by the Japanese Atomic Energy Agency in the early 2000s. And say that, so they took the adsorbent and they actually braided into these large mat structures shown here. So there's a person for size. So these things are quite big, almost like carpets. And they stack them on top of each other uh, to create a large mooring or buoy that could then be deployed in the ocean. Um, and they put it out for 60 days and they brought it back to land for all the chemical processing. What they found is that the requirement of ships and mooring equipment really drove up the cost of uranium production from seawater. And about 70% of the cost was just to these mooring uh, and deployment operations alone. So they iterated on that design and instead of having very heavy mat structures, they wound the adsorbent into a very buoyant braid. So this braid could just be deployed in the seafloor, kind of like uh, creating an artificial kelp field almost of all this different uh, uranium adsorbent. Um, and because it was much lighter weight, they didn't need as much specialized equipment. Um, it was much cheaper. It resulted in a 40% cost reduction of uranium extraction from seawater, bringing the cost down to about $1,200 per kilogram uranium. If we look at uranium price uh, ranges in the past couple of years, we see that on average, the 2020 spot price was about $66 per kilogram. And the most expensive it's ever been was about $300 per kilogram uh, in June 2007, um, which was really due to some um, uh, geopolitical instability and some speculation about India's usage uh, of uranium. So you can see how the, the price uh, in the global price insecurity is really real. But what, we, what this also shows is that, uh, you know, $1,200 per kilogram is really out of the price range for uh, seawater uranium extraction to, to be a viable alternative. So uh, with the cost being so tied to this need to uh, send ships out every single time you deploy the adsorbent or bring them back in, we saw the need in our group to really symbiotically pair the mineral harvester with an existing offshore structure to really enable the chemical processes to take place offshore and reduce the need to bring, uh, bring it back to shore, reduce the ship's uh, labor and fuel costs. So uh, some other things that we had to take into account is that uh, some challenges that exist with the uranium adsorbent itself. Um, the way that the adsorbent is created, first you start off usually with a polyethylene core uh, for strength, to provide some amount of strength to it. And then you add, uh, graft on those amidoxime ligands with irradiation. So irradiation induced grafting to attach those ligands for uranium affinity. But one issue that occurs is that this irradiation inherently damages the polyethylene and reduces its tensile strength. Um, and on there's this trade-off because higher doses of irradiation are linked to increased adsorbent capacity. So more uranium we can extract, but it reduces our tensile strength. So this is a really big problem if we're gonna deploy anything in the ocean with this because that's such a harsh environment. 
So there's a real need to decouple the chemical and mechanical requirements of the adsorbent. So instead of requiring the adsorbent to be extremely strong in tensile strength, we can decouple it by uh, the chemical and mechanical needs by providing some sort of protective enclosure around that adsorbent that can handle the ocean loads. Some other ways, uh, instead of this passive extraction that you could extract minerals from seawater uh, that's gaining a lot of traction these days is what's called deep sea mining. Um, so deep sea mining operations are already looking into how you can extract valuable minerals literally from the sea floor as a way to answer some of these mineral supply issues. Um, and what they do is on the sea floor in many areas, uh, there's these what's called manganese nodules and they look like this and they're literally sedimented uh, nodules that contain very valuable elements such as copper, cobalt, nickel and other rare earth elements. So a lot of companies are trying to literally scrape them up off the seafloor, vacuum them up off the seafloor, all sorts of uh, really uh, interesting ideas. But the issue is because they're on the seafloor, this mining operation can be very cost prohibitive, technologically challenging, and not to mention very destabilizing to marine ecosystems. Um, and there's been some research that suggests that mining the seafloor in this manner could reduce the local biodiversity of that area for millions of years. So I really feel that um, adsorption-based extraction of these kinds of minerals could offer a passive, uh, more sustainable alternative uh, to sourcing our minerals from seawater. And, and uh, that's why we're investigating it in our group. So looking at uh, extracting uranium from seawater, we, we highlighted a couple of key challenges um, and uh, hopefully some, some solutions that you're also all agree with. So the first is that uh, pumping any amount of seawater onshore is gonna be too costly given the amounts of water we need because of how dissolved and dilute um, the uranium is. So the solution there really is to forego this active pumping and instead use ocean currents to help us um, uh, bring, bring the water to the offshore system. Secondly, there's a lot of high costs associated with deploying the uh, uranium adsorbent due to the need to bring it back to shore each month for chemical processing. So instead, if we could symbiotically pair the mineral harvester with an existing offshore structure, it would enable us to have the chemical processes take place offshore. And finally, the chemical optimization of the adsorbent is really limited by the mechanical strength requirements. So we can't uh, increase this adsorption for uranium too much without damaging the polymer in such a way that it can't be deployed viably in the ocean. So a solution there is to really try to decouple the mechanical and chemical requirements of the adsorbent through some kind of additional enclosure. So to uh, tackle these challenges with these solutions, um, we developed the Symbiotic Machine for Ocean Uranium Extraction, or SMORE. And the idea here is that SMORE, while it's specific to uranium, could lay the groundwork for future symbiotic designs for other, other minerals of interest. And so looking at those challenges in offshore development that SMORE addresses, first uh, looking at that need to decouple the mechanical and requir uh, chemical requirements, SMORE uses hard uh, shells uh, to encapsulate the adsorbent to protect, uh, protect them and meet the strength needs of the system. These shells can then be strung together in a net using high strength mooring line. Um, and the goal here is to really reduce the mooring and deployment costs by creating a, a, a symbiotic system that exists offshore for all pro chemical processing to take place. So we designed it to be attached to a, a five megawatt wind turbine, the OC3 high wind uh, from NREL. And shown here is that it really is comprised of an upper and lower deck. So on the upper deck, we have rollers to move the net of adsorbent uh, enclosing shells up and down the platform, uh, excuse me, up and down the length of the turbine. There are tanks on the platform to do uh, the chemical elution. And um, it could be adapted right now, it's just for this turbine, but it can be easily adapted for other offshore structures. Um, it was sized to harvest 1.2 tons of uranium per year, which is enough to fuel a five megawatt nuclear power plant. Um, so if you think about that, a five megawatt wind turbine can now be the infrastructure to start uh, harvesting five megawatts worth of nuclear fuel. So we can almost effectively double the energy output per square meter of ocean with this kind of symbiotic system. <clears throat> 
And there's multiple subsystems involved. So here, this is shown four, for instance, um, so that in the case of any one subsystem being down, um, you, you really increase the overall system uptime uh, because you, they're all decoupled. And what we used here in our system design is really focusing on cost because cost was such an important objective, really driving whether or not seawater uh, uranium extraction was gonna be a viable alternative to terrestrial, uh, terrestrial based mining. So we really start off with understanding uh, the adsorbent itself, its parameters, how it behaves in the ocean, how it will bind with the uranium and then also include some kind of desired uranium output. So what's the goal of the system? How much uranium do we want? Because that will drive how much of the adsorbent we need. All of that is fed into a model that can generate the design geometry uh, for a specific wind turbine. So it can generate how, how uh, the, the system should look on the wind turbine, but it also looks at that kelp field deployment, which is, which is considered a reference model. So you can generate a, a kelp field strategy of how you could do this with just those buoyant braids. And you also generate a s'more strategy. How would you do this symbiotically? What would that structure look like? Um, and so that takes into account the, the symbiotic structures geometry, whether it's a wind turbine or an oil platform, for instance. And then all that gets fed into a cost model, which determines you know, the final cost of uh, uranium production, but it takes into account both project financing parameters and operating parameters, some of which can then be changed and tweaked depending on the situation, so that we finally come out with um, the total uranium production cost, which ideally we want to minimize. So the way that we model the adsorbent behavior, it's actually uh, quite empirically modeled based on a lot of experiments that have been conducted. So it uses uh, the one site ligand saturation model is what it's called to understand uptake. So here C is the uptake of uranium, T is time, uh, beta max is what's called the saturation capacity of the adsorbent, and KD is what's called the uh, half saturation time. So what's really key to note here is these both beta max and KD are actually temperature dependent. So that it favors warmer waters, warmer temperatures for uh, increased uptake. And so if we just plot what that looks like, um, we can see that it's sort of an asymptotic relationship. At some point, um, it'll sort of level off. And then in this case, if we harvested every 30 days, we would go back to zero and then continue uh, saturating again. But uh, some research has shown that the uptake can be reduced by two key factors. The first is biofouling in the ocean due to organism growth. So if we look at a, a, a microscopic view of the adsorbent, we see initially its surface is extremely pristine. But the moment we put it in the ocean, uh, if, for any of you who are, you know, ha have gone out to sea or ha have been on a sailboat, you know all this slime really grows. And so that slime, that biofouling, grows on the adsorbent itself and, and starts filling up um, different pieces of it and can reduce the uptake by 30%. So this is from a controlled lab experiment where half the adsorbent was in dark uh, enclosures uh, with filtered seawater coming through and another set was in uh, completely lit uh, conditions, so very, very high sunlight all the time. So we think this 30% loss is kind of a worst case scenario. But you can see if we add that 30% loss in, uh, we start reducing our total uh, uranium adsorbed uh, into this green uh, dashed line. The second big factor that can reduce uptake is uh, degradation. So every time we do that elution, the polymer gets damaged in some way uh, because of the chemicals that we apply. And so there's been some uh, studies looking at how that uh, uh, loss in uptake uh, occurs as a function of time. So uh, it, what's interesting is that the longer we soak the polymer, um, the more loss of uptake we might have when we do that elution. And the loss is worse for the first reuse, which is shown in black here. So say we soak for 40 days, our loss in uptake will be 40% for our first use but every subsequent reuse, it's less. So in this case, maybe about 35. That's considered a worst case scenario. And a best case scenario is if we can make that elution process pretty gentle, maybe we only have a standard 5% loss in uptake. So not dependent on any sort of time of soaking or number of reuses. Um, and so if we look at the, the plot, that changes how much uh, ad uranium we can uh, collect from that green dashed line to a blue, uh, excuse me, purple dotted line, um, taking into account both biofouling 
decelling and degradation. Now these two factors are incorporated in the cost model, sorting, sort of giving us upper and lower bounds for our, for our uh, uranium price. Um, so in the best case, we have no biofouling and only 5% degradation uh, every elution cycle. And in the worst case, our biofouling is 30% and our degradation uh, changes depending on how long we have the polymer deployed. And then looking at SMORE specifically, um, there's a lot of uh, design variables that were parameterized that could be, could be uh, changed by the model. So we have things like the net itself, you know, what's the size of the shells, the distance between shells, the distance between the net uh, lengths. We have things like the platform size, the number of rollers, the spacing between rollers, um, you know, how big is the turbine itself, the rollers, the distance uh, from the top and bottom as well. And so this is just an example of some of the parameters we used. Uh, so like a, a half meter shell diameter, for instance, um, a turbine radius of 3.2 meters to put things in perspective. So pretty, pretty large structures. Um, and then there were some uh, variables that were calculated uh, based on those geometries uh, that we inputted. And the cost model uh, employs uh, discounted cash flow analysis. So what we do is we follow one unit of adsorbent through different stages of its lifetime. So we start off with producing the adsorbent. What are the costs associated with that? Um, then when we deploy the adsorbent and more it, what are the costs associated with that? Then when we elute and regenerate the adsorbent and put it back out to see what costs are associated with that. And these last two parts of the life cycle are actually continuously happening over time. We don't just put the adsorbent once, we sort of do it a couple times, uh, up to 20 reuses or more. And so all of that can give us a, a final uh, cost per kilogram of uranium adsorbed because we can tabulate how much uranium is covered, recovered at each point in time. And so we might get something like this, where initially we have a lot of upfront costs due to producing that adsorbent, but then once we deploy it, our costs are hopefully, you know, somewhat mitigated, reduced, and uh, compensated by the uranium we cover, we recover after each elution. And this cost model was uh, initially used to uh, really update that kelp field uh, model I talked about earlier. So uh, the kelp field deployment had a few modifications made. So it started to minimize uh, the use of metal chains. We started to use polymer rope instead because it's much lighter weight, uh, less expensive. Um, and instead of bringing the kelp field all the way back to shore, there's now a dedicated mothership somewhere offshore to do the chemical processing to reduce some of that transit back and forth. Um, and smaller work boats are now used to bring the braids to the mothership. So here's a look at how that might happen. You could have these um, braids of adsorbent deployed, they get winched up by a worker boat, that worker boat goes to the mothership for the processing. With these modifications, um, an av we can uh, look at how the uranium production cost was changed. So when looking at these plots I'll show for production costs, they're really broken up into a couple key areas. Those related to the adsorbent, shown in red. Those related to mooring and deployment, uh, highlighted in green here. And those related to the actual chemicals themselves. So for the kelp field strategy, I mentioned earlier, it was $1,200 per kilogram uranium. With these modifications to really drive down the cost, um, we were able to achieve a cost of around $630. So almost a 50% you know, reduction, which is great. But we see that uh, still 37% of these costs are due to mooring and deployment. So those shown in yellow and green here. Um, and those costs are really driven by ships, fuel and labor for servicing this adsorbent, even though it doesn't have to come back to shore, it now goes to a mothership, we still have this problem. So uh, looking specifically at SMORE, um, there's a couple of cost components that are slightly different from the kelp field strategy. So we have our adsorbent production, our mooring and deployment and elution and regeneration, like I said earlier. In adsorbent production, we now have to account for fabricating that net and those shells. We have capital and operating costs in our mooring and deployment. Um, and in the capital costs, we now have a lot of stainless steel structure that we need to implement. And we've charged, uh, we're charging a, a fee by the wind turbine owner for the fact that they've already done the permitting work to use the, the, the marine space there. We could have incorporated this fee more as an operating cost, but we thought to start a capital cost was pretty reasonable as well. 
And then our operating costs is we need to be able to uh, replenish the chemicals, we need to be able to remove the product and waste. And then finally, in elution and regeneration, we use the same onshore facilities uh, as the kelp field strategy for purifying the uranium at the end to yellow cake. So how does it compare? How does SMORE do to the reference kelp field deployment? So I mentioned the kelp field with those modifications is now about $600 per kilogram. Um, and SMORE can achieve a cost of about $440 per kilogram for an intermediate case. And we see that as suspected, the bulk of those cost reductions are due to mooring uh, reduction costs, so about 45% reduction there. Um, and then I mentioned that we had those best and worst case bounds on our, on our model due to biofouling and degradation. So what's shown here is the uranium production cost as a band for both of those strategies. So uh, in the worst case, for instance, with tons of biofouling and degradation, the kelp field production cost, depending on how many times you reuse the adsorbent, can be as much as $870 uh, dollars per kilogram. And in the worst case, s'more is something like $590 per kilogram uranium. In the best case scenario, if we could mitigate biofouling as well as uh, degradation of the polymer, the cost of uranium from s'more could be as low as $313. And that's really key because I mentioned in June 2007, uranium spot price hit a peak of $300. So we're right, starting to be right in that ballpark where we might be cost competitive. And actually, uh, one interesting point is that breeder reactors, which reuse spent fuel, they're considered cost competitive at a price of $300 per kilogram uranium as well. And around 5% of our nuclear reactors today are already breeder reactors. So this is uh, certainly more feasible and viable if we are going to use uranium in this manner. We also looked at uh, cost sensitivities uh, for future research. What, what might you tweak? Um, and so as you can see, things that don't have a huge impact um, in best and worst cases, best case, no biofouling degradation. Worst case, we do have biofouling in that bad degradation. Um, the number of turbines doesn't change things a ton, nor how many loops we use on that turbines, um, nor the size of our fleet and ships. So a lot of those operational and mooring parameters don't have a big impact. But what does is things like the water temperature. So the warmer the water, uh, the uh, excuse me, the warmer the water, the larger the reduction in cost, especially if we don't have to deal with biofouling. Um, whereas colder water really negatively impacts our cost for both best and worst case scenarios. And finally, the degradation of the polymer, if we can really reduce that degradation, we can drive the cost down quite a bit for both best and worst case scenarios. This is really key because now this gives us sort of a roadmap for research uh, in the future for uranium adsorption from seawater, showing that we've really driven the cost down on a uh, mechanical side, the mechanical system. What's left is really the chemistry and making this work uh, from a chemical standpoint in these areas of temperature and degradation. And so just briefly, I'll touch upon the fact that we actually built this uh, to test it out. So we use the cost model to to drive a system design. Um, and we have both a, a dynamic design that uses uh, the motion between two rollers I mentioned and a stationary system design. Uh, both systems went to 18 feet. Uh, the dynamic system was rotating at 12 centimeters per second. And we used two different shell designs, one with slotted holes and one with circular holes to see if the shell would have any impact on uranium uptake. Um, and we also, we had nine samples per shell per prototype over a 56 day deployment. So we could get the, uh, the adsorption over time to create those, those plots that I showed earlier. Um, and so we deployed off the coast of um, Massachusetts at Massachusetts uh, Maritime Academy. So if you're familiar with Boston, we were all the way down here. This great deployment site right off the dock that gets a lot of wind and waves due to Cape Cod Canal sort of whipping around uh, and creating a pretty harsh ocean environment, but still easily accessible from the dock. And we tested these adsorbents, therefore, in real ocean conditions. So here's a look at the adsorbents. They're called the AI-8 adsorbents from Oak Ridge National Lab. They, uh, the environmental parameters in the ocean were monitored, but not controlled. So it was the first time this was done. Most other tests were in lab settings. Um, we weighed each adsorbent into a mini braid. So the idea being that uh, as the adsorbent's out there for longer, it will have more biofouling. So any weight additions might be due to just biofouling alone. Um, and we, uh, here's just an example of actually uh, taking samples from those shells uh, on the prototype. 
And we used two nylon mesh bags that also hold held adsorbent to serve as a control with no enclosure. How much uranium do we adsorb and is the shell negatively impacting uptake? Here's a look at uh, the prototype in action on a very, very calm uh, fall day on the Cape. And we took video at each week. So of the nine week deployment, this is week eight of the stationary system and the continuous moving system, uh, the dynamic system. And one thing to, to note here is there's a lot of biofouling or growth on the stationary system. And you can see it's starting to clog up a lot of the holes on the different shells, perhaps limiting water uh, into the system. Uh, whereas the dynamic system is is pretty free, uh, possibly because it's rubbing up against different parts, possibly because the moving nature makes it more difficult for uh, critters to, uh, you know, sort of colonize. So that was really interesting. So when we actually looked at uh, the minerals that we extract, um, here's a look at the plot for, for one example um, over time shown on X and the different uh, mineral concentrations. So we see that uranium is not the dominant element extracted. So uranium shown in the X's here, we actually get quite a lot more calcium and magnesium as well as iron, for instance. Um, and uh, in the ocean, the magnesium to uranium ratio is about 500,000 to one. On this adsorbent, uh, the ratio is about 15 to one. So it's still getting much more magnesium than uranium, but it's doing much better than the ambient ocean environment. So it's still quite uh, doing a good job of getting the uranium specifically. Um, then looking at the two prototypes and the different uh, systems we had and their uranium adsorption, we see over time there was, there was no real discernible difference between the different uh, systems, stationary moving or the shell design, slotted or holes uh, or the mesh bag. And uh, also in the total uranium collected at the end, um, there was really uh, very little difference. And we suspect that that's because the dynamic system actually wasn't moving for the first uh, of almost third of the deployment, um, or first two thirds of the deployment um, due to some mechanical issues. And that is the most important piece. As you can see the asymptotic relationship um, over time, you really start to saturate. And so any changes you have later on in the deployment will have not as much of an impact as if they had earlier. Um, and then the second piece is the water was starting to get colder over time, which I'll show in a second. So um, as we saw, the colder temperature really inhibits uranium uh, adsorption. What we saw is that um, if we just take into account temperature, which we can model with our empirical relationship, and biofouling, we don't get the actual uptake that occurred. So uh, shown in these colored lines on the bottom is the actual uptake from all the different designs. Uh, the predicted uptake, just taking into account temperature is shown in blue in purple. And then the predicted uptake taking into account biofouling, that 30% loss is shown in green. So this dashed uh, green line. And so we see that there's still some uh, discrepancy here that can't be predicted with our existing empirical relationships. So some more testing needs to be done. Some uh, suspect, some things we suspect is that right now, the, uh, um, the in colder water, another element called vanadium might be binding faster and in the same sites that uranium would take up and actually out competing uranium. And also there's been some research to show that when large amounts of copper are present in water, that can also impede the uranium uptake. So we need more research to really be able to quantify this a little bit better. So with all those uh, you know, lessons we've learned from uranium, the next real opportunity I see is looking at raw materials for batteries. So if we take a look at uh, battery technology for electric vehicles, smart, uh, smart cars, uh, excuse me, electric vehicles, uh, personal electronic devices and so forth, we see that the largest cost components, uh, most expensive elements are uh, cobalt and lithium, both of which are readily available in the ocean. Um, specifically, if we look at cobalt, almost 60% of it comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is a country that's been affected by decades of war. So it's an uh, extremely volatile area to get your, your important mineral source from. And so this heavy reliance on minerals um, really leads to critical supply issues when they come from these unstable regions. And these regions don't have very good environmental uh, you know, standards, so it can have huge environmental negative uh, footprints by getting it from here. So we did a little work on how you can do adsorption-based extraction of cobalt similar to uranium. 
And uh, a difference here is that uh, uranium is pretty evenly distributed throughout the world's ocean, both in the water column and around the world. Whereas cobalt has a, has a peak in a dissolved concentration that occurs in the upper, uh, upper third of the ocean, aside from the, the, mix, the top mixed layer. So it's a little bit better concentrated, a little bit deeper down and then tapers off. Adsorbents already exist for, from, for removing cobalt from wastewater. So we could, because it's so detrimental to human health, we don't want it in our water systems. So we could see about modifying these for just looking at seawater specifically. So one idea we had is, is, is instead of offshore wind turbines, because the offshore wind industry in the United States is still charting to take off, what if we looked at offshore oil platforms, um, for instance, those in the Gulf of Mexico that are ready to be decommissioned? Can we think of a second life for them? And so we just highlighted in red here, 76 um, de platforms that are ready to be decommissioned. And if we say that with possible future R&D, the cobalt adsorption uh, could be increased to have 20 days of saturation of 10 grams of cobalt per kilogram adsorbent, which is uh, pretty possible, I think, with exerted R&D efforts, then we could harvest 2,350 tons of cobalt annually from just these 70 odd platforms. And this amounts to uh, over a quarter of the 2017 U.S. cobalt consumption, um, or in other metrics, um, over half a million Tesla Model 3 batteries uh, could be made using this cobalt, each of them requiring 4.5 kilograms. So this is a real opportunity here um, we see to use our shores um, for uh, harvesting some of the minerals key for these uh, clean energy technologies. So what other minerals might we get from the ocean? So you can make this decision based on a couple of different strategies I see. One of which is could, you could target those elements that have limited terrestrial abundance compared to their oceanic abundance. So those that are much more abundant in the ocean, let's go for them. So shown here, you see the sea to land ratio of things like lithium, uranium is pretty high, um, cobalt 70, so not as high, but uh, certainly lithium is a really good one to look into from that perspective. Another idea is that, uh, can you target elements uh, based on their seawater concentration versus their market price? So as they become more and more expensive, their market price increases, maybe their uh, seawater concentration, maybe that makes them more and more viable. So you can see things like uranium, maybe just on the cup, cusp of viability in, in this example, whereas maybe lithium, magnesium, calcium, they're much, much more viable. Uh, a third thing to consider is that, as I showed, you can extract multiple elements from the same adsorbent. So if you can uh, co-extract these elements, you could make this much more economical. So they typically exhibit this multi-element capability and uh, co obtaining multiple elements with one technology could really reduce the overall cost of extracting the target element. So in the case of uranium, so that's shown in black here from that, uh, ocean test we, we did, you also collect quite a bit of vanadium, which is shown in yellow here. Um, and vanadium is a really important element in steel alloys. So if we could extract both of those and uh, harvest value from both of those, we could reduce the overall cost. And I think there's quite a lot that still needs to be done that that we'll be working on in my group uh, to passively extract minerals from seawater. So what we really find is that if you're gonna do this, uh, what is really key is having some kind of symbiotic offshore system. You can't go out there just to deploy and retrieve the adsorbent on its own. It's gonna be far too costly. You really need these structures out there on their own to do the chemical processing and tie in with an existing infrastructure element. In the case of uranium, by doing this kind of symbiotic strategy, you can possibly achieve cost competitiveness with breed, nuclear breeder reactors, so break, which break even at about $300 per kilogram. So we were able to drive the cost down from $1,200 to $300 in the best case scenario. And this technology can be applied to adsorbing other met metals such as cobalt and lithium, which are very interesting uh, for battery technology. And uh, obtaining multiple elements with the same adsorbent could further drive down the cost of the target element. And so finally, what I think could be really interesting is, you know, if we have something like an offshore wind turbine, which requires a battery, if we can use that platform to harvest the minerals that, that are then used for the battery to store its energy, that could be a really great, uh, you know, life cycle to pursue, getting everything we need for that platform right there.
So with that, I'll just uh, take a brief moment to thank all of the different funding agencies and collaborators that made this possible. And I'd love to spend some time answering uh, all of your questions. Thank you. Great, thanks Maha, Yay, good job. Um, let's see, so uh, we can open it up to a couple questions. Looks like uh, Aaron Zuckerman, you have a question? Uh, yes, have you looked at the applications of your work to space and kind of in situ research uh, source uh, utilization you know, I have not, but that sounds really interesting. Is that something that you work on? Yes, uh, I work with, with Dr. Mason Peck, uh, the Space Systems Design Studio. We, mm -hmm. We've very interest. there's a lot of interest of how you take anything from the space environment and use it. Oh, that would be really cool. Thanks, yeah, I'll look into that. Maybe I'll reach out to you if that's all right. Okay. All right, great, uh, thanks. Another Aaron, Aaron Brzezinski. Uh, thank you so much for your excellent uh, talk. This is really, really interesting. I was just curious on a kind of similar note to um, the question posed by um, uh, the, the other gentleman named Aaron. Um, is there an opportunity to use radiodurins or other microbes um, to add to the adsorbent to potentially even increase the, um, the, the absor ad absorption of um, uranium or other uh, minerals? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I haven't done a ton of work in that area at all, but um, I know that there's a professor, Buzz Barstow at Cornell, does a lot of research in microbial uh, microbes to extract minerals. Um, and I think that would be really, really interesting uh, because you know if you can increase the adsorption instead of using something like a passive polymer, but instead incorporate these microbes um, and really drive up the capacity. I think that could be really, really interesting. And there's been a lot of interest in that space these days. Uh, so I think that could be very cool to pair. Thanks. Great. Um, so Maha, I was going to ask you a question. Um, so yeah. it seems like I, I really, I, it seems like one potential viable option is, is as you said, to harvest multiple um, uh, um, minerals. And so you can imagine then you have multiple customers, right? And you're doing the same work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, all of a sudden you're harvesting, you know, lithium for Apple and um, uranium for the DOE, right? And stuff like that. So I guess my question is, um, how easy is it to separate the minerals once you get them on there? Um, mm -hmm. Is that a hard thing to do? Great question. Yeah, so I haven't uh, looked at that too much, but from what I understand, a lot of terrestrial mining happens in a similar way where in order to get uh, one mineral, you often co-extract it from another. So you have a primary middle of interest, but it requires you to extract something else. So a really great example is like nickel and cobalt. They often are extracted together. So the processing strategies that we have for mining them already remove uh, cobalt from a nickel uh, or vice versa. So I think that that's the case for a lot of uh, terrestrial mining. So I wouldn't be surprised if we could tie in with some of these existing methods that already try to split the co-extraction of terrestrial sources uh, and adapt them for uh, splitting the co-extraction from uh, seawater sources. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, great. Um, I, I have a second follow on question and that is you have these plots of the production costs for s'more and kelp. It looked like kelp actually increases where s'more sort of seems to ask them to it out. Is that yeah. actually the case? Let's, uh, I can go right to that. Yes, yeah, so great question. So um, what's occurring here is how many times we reuse the adsorbent. So mm -hmm. as we increase the number of uses, uh, the cost from each strategy really changes. So research hasn't been done on more than 20 reuses. So that's why it caps out right here. So what you can see is that in the case of the kelp field, there is some sweet spot uh, of number of reuses. Um, and this is because um, all of the 
uh, manufacturing that has to go into making that kelp field um, is quite substantial. So after, depending on how many reuses you have, you then have to create all of this adsorbent again, uh, put it all in this kelp field and deploy it at this time from shore because your mothership is there for chemical processing, but the deployment of adsorbent comes all the way from shore and that gets to be a really, really high cost. So that's why there's, there's a sweet spot. But in the case of s'more, um, we only have to send one a really large ship or a couple of really large ships when we need to replace all of the adsorbent. And all we're replacing is a net. We don't have any sort of anchoring or mooring system, so it's mm. a lot lighter. Um, so I suspect that if the number of reuses did go out farther, uh, we could see a similar relationship where there might be a sweet spot, but because we haven't done much research past 20, that's kind of why it looks like it kind of mm -hmm. levels off there. I see. Okay, great. Excellent. Any other questions from folks? Um, okay, well, feel free to reach out to Maha. And again, she will be here actually in Ithaca and hopefully we'll all be getting together more uh, sort of this summer, this fall. So thank you so much, Maha, for taking the time yeah. uh, to present to us. Really interesting work. So Awesome. Thanks, everyone. It was great being here. Thanks, everyone, Bye. for coming.